So uh, at a high level, this is a high level pictorial view um, of the processor. We have the cores, which are highlighted now in red. We have the graphics block, which is highlighted at the bottom, and everything else, which is a ring and system agent. Uh, this uh, microarchitecture is new uh, core, significant changes in the core, significant changes in the graphics, processor graphics, all on 32 nanometer, giving us more performance and lower power. We have a uh, core feature, uh, the Intel uh, AVX technology, which is a um, uh, extensive floating point applications can benefit from, and Bob will talk to that. Uh, the uh, Turbo Boost technology already introduced in the core processors has significantly uh, been enhanced in Sandy Bridge. Uh, we get more performance and we also have a new feature that provides dynamic performance uh, in an inter interactive uh, application setting and I'll talk about that in a little more detail and there's more detail on that in depth uh, in the follow-on session. Uh, processor graphics engine on 32 nanometer. We have a new uh, high bandwidth, low latency interconnect called the ring architecture that connects all the components on the chip. I'll talk about that. And we've integrated the memory controller. We also have integrated PCI Express ports, display engine, and so forth. Basically, this product uh, really will deliver great performance at lower power, a lot of innovations that will uh, show up at the end user as uh, higher uh, usability and a great user experience in all the media and uh, graphics uh, domains, as well as more traditional legacy compute uh, functions. And we'll hand it off to Bob here. Thank you, Ofer. Thank you, Ofer. Um, so it's a real pleasure for me to be here again. I was here on the uh, Conroe launch, and uh, things have changed significantly since then. I mean, then we had uh, two CPUs and a shared cache, and it was all on one die, and that was pretty remarkable. And now what we're talking about is here what we'll be launching next year. We have four cores. We have this ring interconnect, we have a whole bunch of stuff that used to be out in the system. We have the graphics. It's, uh, <clears throat> it's kind of a new world, but nonetheless, there's a lot of innovation, a lot of stuff that is going on in the core and uh, you know, to make legacy programs run faster and to open up areas for entirely new programs. So, you know, if you ask me, is it an exciting time to be a computer architect? Yes, it continues to be very exciting. So let's see if we can make, there, there those are the cores spinning around a little bit. Um, so there are a bunch of major uh, enhancements that I'll be going through. I'm going to just do a uh, shallow dive in this session. In the next session, we, uh, Ofer and I, will both go deeper into all these topics. And in the next session, there will be questions allowed. This session does not have questions. So I'll talk about three main areas of the, uh, of the processor. Uh, we have a front end where instructions are decoded. And the, uh, the major uh, enhancement that was done there was the addition of what we're calling a decoded UOP cache. As many of you may know, uh, in IA processors, in Intel processors, we decode x86 instructions into what we call UOPs or micro operations. This cache stores these micro operations uh, saves them. It's just like a normal iCache. You get some amount of hit rate. You get to, to use this stuff. But the main innovation there is you get to shut off the rest of the pipeline. The thing that's really cool here is you turn off the traditional decoder, and so you're getting the same or even better bandwidth at lower power. And a theme that's going to come up throughout uh, the Sandy Bridge presentations is that power is something that we're always trying to move from one place to another. Somebody needs it, and somebody else has it. And in older designs, you were just, say, stuck with power over here, and you couldn't use it over there. Now, whether it's the turbo, where we turn the frequency and voltage up in one place when we don't need the power elsewhere, or inside the core itself, where the instructions 
the instruction decode can hand their power to another portion of the core or another portion of the device. Uh, another, so this, this feature, it simultaneously gains performance while saving power. The main features we'll be talking about in uh, the memory cluster, when I say memory cluster, I'm talking about the memory cluster on the uh, processor core. So this is the data cache that is closest to the processor uh, and the mid-level cache. The main feature there, uh, it's something that people have been asking about for a long time from uh, Intel processors. We effectively have gone to a two-load port architecture. Uh, doubling the load bandwidth was one of the single uh, most performance, you know, highest uh, percentage performance gain features in the Sandy Bridge processor. The uh, data cache itself handles even more bandwidth than that. It's running as a somewhat as a background task uh, with the bandwidth, uh, and I'll go into that in more detail. And then finally, we'll talk about the main features in the out of order and execution portion of the device. It was essentially a ground up rebuild of the out of order and execution. And the main reason there is we wanted to double the floating point performance. And to double the floating point performance in the most, uh, in a way that matched many programs, matched the way we had been providing floating point performance from the core in the past uh, was to double the vector width. We have a SIMD instruction set. We doubled the width of that SIMD instruction set and also show some, some foils about how we did that in a power and area uh, efficient manner. So first we'll go through the front end real fast. And this is the front end. It could have been in the uh, Conroe or in uh, or in Nahalem. Uh basically uh, it has a 32k I cache, uh, very good branch predictors, four wide decode. Sometimes we get a little bit more than that because we do a few tricks internally. Um, pretty much we we provide we try to provide four four UOPs per cycle every cycle, and that that's our goal. Uh, but sometimes there are hiccups, sometimes you bump into instructions that are harder to decode or situations that may require uh, specialized hardware to deal with. So the key change here, there are actually two changes that were done in the front end. The first one is highlighted in yellow on top. It is rebuilding the branch predictor. And uh, we've had branch predictors in our cores since the Pentium. The Pentium had one of the first branch predictors. And every year they get better, and every year people ask, well, you know, how much better can a branch predictor get? Okay? If you're at 96% branch prediction rate, what do you get from another half percent? And you have to look at that upside down. You say, well, if I'm at a 4% misprediction rate, when I get another half percent, I have decreased my misprediction rate by 12%. That could be another few hundred or maybe even another thousand instructions on the correct path. Branch prediction, improving it, is the most power efficient thing you can do. Correct code is the most power efficient code. So then you see in the orange boxes the next two stages of this. The branch prediction feeds the UOP cache hit logic. And then you notice there's no boxes. The red arrow is free. It's a shorter latency path. There's less toggling. Less toggling means less power. The UOP cache is down there next to where this queue is to go to the out of order uh, portion of the machine. The idea is when you hit the UOP cache, you do less work, you do it faster, and you get more bandwidth. Because all these little edge effects that I talked about in the front end the UOP cache doesn't see them. They were all handled by the legacy pipeline. You handle them once and you reap the benefit many times. I mentioned the memory cluster. This is a picture uh, essentially the Nehalem memory cluster. We have the, uh, the scheduler there. That's the scheduler that's common for all you uh, micro ops in the machine. Uh, 32K data cache. Lots of store buffers and forwarding logic. Essentially, that hasn't changed much in the uh, Sandy Bridge. Um, 
Nahalam added excellent uh, misalignment support, and we inherited some very good prefetchers from Nahalam. And then there's the 256K mid-level cache. But the thing to notice is that there's a single load port and a single, uh, actually, these two ports that are both labeled store. We uh, treat the uh, where you want to store data and what you want to store as two different functions. So we have three ports, and only one of them is able to do loads. And loads are the most important, uh, one of the most important UOPs that you have in any computer program. So the trick is essentially to make those load and store ports symmetric. Okay, you take that load port and allow it to do stores, but more importantly is you took the existing store port and allow it to also do loads. So effectively, the uh, load bandwidth is doubled. Now, I'll talk in a second about AVX technology, which is our new vector extension to 256 bits. It doubles the vector instruction set. This feature was one of the key uh, enablers for that because we wanted to maintain the same bytes of data coming into the calculation to match up with the calculations. If you starve the flops, you won't get to use the flops. So here, by doubling the load bandwidth, we were able to, to extract the goodness of the, uh, you know, uh, of the AVX instruction set. There's also mentioned at the bottom that internal to this, there are, is 48 bytes per cycle of internal bandwidth. The cache itself is capable of two loads per cycle and one store that's taking place as a background activity. Uh, this is basically 50% more bandwidth than you saw in earlier processors. As I said earlier, the uh, addition of the second load port is the single feature that had the highest delta in performance in Sandy Bridge. Finally, you get to the floating point in media execution as we see it in the core. Tom will talk a lot about media execution in the graphics unit, but um, you know that the, the uh, processor core has been doing a lot of media calculations for years. In fact, one of the demos we saw earlier today uh, had uh, um, some sort of picture processing, and there was another demo that had this 3D room, and a lot of that is being done on the CPU. So here's our uh, current Nahalem-style execution pipeline. It's kind of difficult to understand all that plumbing, but we have three execution ports. Um, I show them in red, yellow, and purple, and uh, one of the things that's highlighted in this picture are these red, yellow, and purple wide arrows going into the reorder buffer. The reorder buffer is the place you put your data when you decide to retire it, when you decide to send it to the registers and bring the processor state to the exact same state that a programmer would have seen on an 8086 or any other simple microprocessor, even though it's gone through all this data flow, out of order scheduling. So, there are sort of two tricks that are highlighted here, or two key advances that uh, our architects, that we were able to make. One is moving to a physical register file implementation. What this means is that the data that is written back to this scheduler no longer gets written back again to the retirement. Uh, we only have one copy of the data, it's written once, it's stored in one place, you have less bits toggling, you have less bits leaking. It's a more efficient way of managing your data, and when we were making the vectors twice as wide, we knew we needed something like that to, uh, to deal with the power we were creating. The other thing is, currently in, uh, say, in the Halem or a Conroe, you have an execution stack that is dedicated to floating point operations. It's 128 bits wide. It can do three operations per cycle. And you have a parallel stack of hardware that can do vector integer operations. Uh, a lot of the media codes are vector integer. This hardware is not using the same resources. It is separate execution hardware. So we looked at that picture, and some of our smarter engineers said, well, what if we were able to fuse that functionality in some way and use both these 128-bit data paths at the same time? So that's what you see on this picture. First, the uh, thing that flipped up at the top 
is the physical register file, and you see that the three great big arrows that went to the retirement logic turn into thin arrows. And that's supposed to symbolize the fact that data is no longer traveling over those channels. It's just status. It says, I'm done. The data is sitting in the register. Anybody who needs it can take it. The other thing is note that the two stacks, the integer and the floating point stacks, are harnessed together. So AVX provides a 256 floating point multiply per cycle. You see the high half is using the legacy floating point stack. The low half of that is using the legacy integer portion of the stack. The, it can simultaneously do a 256 pit floating point add. Same trick is being used. Really, the only thing that has to be totally new hardware going all the way across the two stacks is when you have shuffles and permutes, when you have to take data from one half of the register and move it to the other half. So a new shuffle unit had to be built. But other than that, it was really just re, you know, applying some surgery and magic to the hardware that was already there. And then finally, there's the move and logical units. AVX, uh, I'll talk about this in more detail in the next session. Um, we try to get, uh, you know, you can get two, uh, two, twice the flops per cycle for vector applications. Um, the, the, the second load port maintains the same balance of bandwidth to flops that we had in SSE. So it's a very efficient implementation. And now I'm going to turn it over to my esteemed colleague, uh, Tom Piazza. So as, as Bob said, it's an exciting time to be, uh, be an architect, actually. It's actually exciting also to be a graphics architect. Um, just throw a little chuckle that I have. Uh, was it uh, two years ago, 2007, when Paul Avellini said 10x by 10? And I went back to Folsom and I said, well, then therefore we have to beat that because now the industry knows where we're going, so we have to do more than that. Um, and as you saw earlier, he said uh, we showed 25x. That was intentional. Uh, it, uh, we got a little bit more than we expected, only because our power was a little bit less than we expected. But it was all planned to go there. Um, if we go take a look at um, a graphics engine, you know these pictures are similar from from pretty much everyone building a modern graphics engine. There's there's uh, some control of vertex processing. There's control of pixel processing, and. Uh, Typically in the middle, we think about these shader units. Uh, we call them EUs for execution units. And then a bunch of fixed functions that do texture sampling and color blending, et cetera. One of the key initiatives here was to move the performance of the graphics up significantly while maintaining the same socket power. So as people have been talking about power, 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 it's one of the most important things on a mobile platform to stay contained within either a 17 watt socket, a 25 watt socket, or a 35 watt socket. So most of the work was done in this, uh, the graphics core in Sandy Bridge is a radical departure from what we were doing before and was focused on energy efficiency to get the performance. A lot of performance optimizations in many areas. And you know we kicked off going after media Oh, back in 2002, right, Han? Um, <clears throat> and we saw media as an emerging uh, usage model. And in the past, when we were doing media mostly in the shader units, um, we have uh, revamped that as well. And I'll go into that in a little more detail. So when we say native strengths enhanced, uh, parallel compute models, we've been doing that for years. The very fact that we were using our shader units to do all the media motion estimation, uh, motion compensation, I should say, in, in IDCTs, we, we had been uh, very programmable from the start. And there are a lot of shader ops that are not floating point in this machine, specifically tailored towards media. Uh, so that's what we mean by the native strengths. And then, of course, there are optimizations uh, that we can take advantage of being within the CPU itself. 
Uh, there are many, many knobs. I'm, I'm just going to highlight here uh, the shader unit in the class that is at uh, 3 o'clock. We can go into more of the components of, of the design. But uh, one of the things we've been focusing on is it's not the amount of shader units you have, it's how effective your shader units are. So even though you can't necessarily count the number of hour shader units to exactly what SIMD or floating point performance relative to competition, the main thing is that generation on generation, if we were to tell you a shader count, you cannot really extrapolate what the performance of that is, because um, it's usually more than the number connotes. Um, so one of the things we've done is increase our register space, uh, which keeps more data contained, less spill and fill, just like there's a UOP cache in this case. It's a way to make sure the data stays local and not, we're not bouncing it out to the rest of the fabric and then having to pull it back in. Um, with the emergence of uh, more and more parallel compute models, whether it's DirectX 11 on 10, whether it's uh, the OpenCL semantics, uh, going beyond 3D, if you will, as an application, uh, we have to be ready for significant uh, branches in code in a SIMD engine. And the main thing here is to uh, do that very efficiently. We do things like branches in one instruction. If you do an if, you know, we set the right predicate, pred predications. And the view from a software programming is that you're, you're actually programming scalars and all the, parallel, all the parallelism happens under the covers. So you don't have to think in vectors on this machine. Um, also as part of this, you know, 3D uses an inverse here and there, but other applications, media, for example, is doing a lot of gamma correction to and from, so you end up with a lot of transcendental math, like accelerating a power function, as, a, as an example. So we've significantly beefed up the, uh, the transcendental performance per shader unit. And, you know, just to get more throughput out of the engine, take a... CISC view of the instruction set where we started off more as a RISC view. So a lot of the instructions that might have decomposed from a direct X view to four instructions on just about everything. And the net of that is, you know, relative to prior generations, we actually do see twice the throughput per shader unit. So that's why I'm saying don't just count shader units because for the same number we're, we're seeing twice the throughput. There are other things that we've done and that is we've moved some functions that we were emulating in the shader, if you will, to fixed function offloads as another way to, to uh, get much more power efficiency. The shader units are um, the most power dense area of the system. So by offloading back into fixed functions, we were able to also get the throughput up while keeping the power down. On medium. So I said, we started off with this in an early view uh, back in 2002, and um, we turned this into a significant asset for us, but we originally started with the shader units doing most of the work, and basically it just had a VLD decoder and hardware. Um, as this has evolved, we've been doing a lot of uh, innovation, if you will, at, at, on the soft software, in the shaders, and over time, we sort of harden those blocks and say, okay, we know this algorithm, we know that it works, we know that it's best of class, and, and what we do is we start to harden it with some fixed functions. Um, that, so that, that is a combination of being able to do the different VLD streams, as well as um, you know hardware full decode on uh, encode, adding some uh, hard blocks, that are an assist of the shader units that are sitting down in a function that we call like a media sampler. And, uh, and that gets us much higher throughputs in the same or lower power envelope. And uh, while we still maintain the flexibility, I talked about what we were doing on the shader units for 3D, but we're still maintaining and evolving the shader units for media so we can keep on evolving the whole media at the same time containing the power. The, uh, and out of that, if we keep the battery, if we keep the power low, we get much longer battery life, okay? Very, very important. Or we can move the level of media down into lower power segments. And we have 
significant, significant performance on HD media decode and encode, and just overall make a better interactive experience. Integration. One of the things that has helped us for sure is uh, if you looked at the, uh, on the way to getting to 10x by 10 or more than 10x by 10, is we have actually moved a silicon process every year. In the chipsets, we were on N minus one is what Intel calls it. When the, when the CPUs, you know, retired a process, it moves over to the chipsets. And, uh, and sometimes we were on N minus two. And, uh, what we've been doing for the past few years is moving, or just say, catching up to the CPU from a silicon process with, uh, with a known target that on Sandy Bridge would be integrated uh, on the CPU. So we're on the leading edge 32 nanometer process. That gave us you know, more transistors per millimeter squared, lower, lower toggle power on all those transistors, so that has helped us as well. Um, as I already said, we revamped the architecture to put fixed functions wherever they made sense. Uh, in fact, we asked the question the other way is, does it make sense to make something programmable? And if it doesn't make it a fixed function where the beginning was, hey, how many things can we program now? It's how many things don't we have to program? Um, sharing with the last level cache, which Ofra will go over in more detail. Um, if, uh, the bandwidth on the cache is about four times what the DRAM bandwidth is. So a combination of when we hit that cache, we get an instantaneous, we can actually rip through that particular uh, part of the graphics workload very, very fast uh, on the cache hits. So that helped us on performance. But it also lowered power. Every time we hit that cache, we're not lighting a DRAM. Every time we're not lighting the DRAM, we're saving energy on the I.O. of the chip and the DRAM power itself. In the old world, trying to shift power, power budgets around, any, you know, the cache has also helped lower the power, and, and that may be more significant than the ability to increase the performance. Uh, uh, it's more important than lowering the bandwidth to the DRAM from a standpoint of we, we may not be DRAM limited in our performance, but we end up being power limited. So hitting that cache, is always good. And then using CPU power management. Uh, being on the same die allows us to shift power around dynamically on the previous system, which was uh, uh, known as Iron Lake, I believe. What's it called? Arendale? Okay. Uh, it was actually a multi-chip package. So we had some limits on the same package to be able to move things back and forth but you can't sense it very rapidly and with an on-die power control unit. We can actually sense things and move things back and forth very, very rapidly with separate power rails and separate clocking between the two devices and get the best overall performance. The tendency is that applications tend to be graphics hogs from a standpoint of the need of performance or CPU. You rarely see actually a compete on both. So, so it tends to be very nice that we can modally shift one way or modally shift the other way. And that has helped a lot, bringing all the turbo boost stuff that we've been doing on CPUs now to, I won't say the complete form, I'm sure there's more innovation coming uh, on, on the graphics itself to get significant performance boosts with the turbo modes. And with that, I'm going to move over to Ofer. The uh, rest of the chip. Um, my two co my colleagues here had uh, a tough job on one hand. They had to take good products like Westmere or previous generation graphics and improve on them. And I think both uh, domains did an excellent job. Uh, in my case, we really didn't have a good story of an integrated graphics product in previous generations. So we really started uh, from scratch. We, uh, everything that connects the cores, connects to the system, memory controller, Everything was redesigned in Sandy Bridge from scratch. We uh, took the goals that we had of integrating graphics, giving performance, uh, integrating the whole platform onto one chip, doing shared power management, and the architecture that uh, I'll talk about here is a result of that. So we talked about the cores, we talked about the graphics, and I'll try to briefly talk about all the rest, which is actually quite a lot. So what does this full integration give us? 
or, or what does it look like? In the previous generation, as Tom mentioned, we really had a multi-chip package. There was a separate CPU, more traditional CPU, uh, that looked a little bit like the Marone Conroe family, the Nehalem, uh, with uh, cores and a last level cache and a QPI bus connected to a chipset that had integrated graphics, had memory control with PCI Express. All these were really two separate pieces of silicon sitting in a multi-chip package. We uh, basically dropped all that and integrated everything to one piece of silicon, as I mentioned, uh, giving us a lot of benefits. So uh, some of the optimizations were mentioned. I'll probably go over them again, but I'll talk in more detail. So one of the big things is really being able to move power around. In the previous generation, there is some uh, ability to shift power from graphics to the CPU, but it's done through a driver. It's obviously much slower. Here we have on-die controls. We have on-die monitoring uh, of the power in both the graphics domain and the cores, so we can quickly uh, move the power back and forth. Uh, the new interconnect that we have is very high bandwidth. We're providing 4x the bandwidth of the previous generation in the cache. That is a, really a necessity for the graphics. The graphics has very high gra uh, bandwidth demand, probably higher than uh, or close to what all the four cores need together can be consumed by the graphics. So this new interconnect that we have, the ring interconnect together with the uh, new cache provides that. Uh, memory control integration and PCI Express controller integration were done uh, very tightly uh, coupled with the core and graphics domain in such a way that the latency to memory, the latency to PCI is very low and we save power. We don't have intermediate buses anymore. And we have a very modular architecture. This ring architecture is laid out in, the, uh, in such a way that we can easily add and remove cores when necessary. Uh, the graphics also can have different versions and actually have a little build here that shows how easy is it for us to actually create a two core product. And it's almost as easy as uh, you see here, even though design managers sitting here in the room probably won't think it's that easy, but it's pretty close. Let's talk a little bit about the ring. So we uh, went and looked at previous generations, what the interconnect between the cores was. Um, the ring architecture as a concept actually started in uh, Westmere, e in Halem EX, I'm sorry, which is a eight core server. And uh, they needed that bandwidth for server. We actually figured out that we need similar bandwidth and similar behavior in the client space. The previous generation, the Halem Westmere had a single last level cache with a interconnect that was shared and went to all to one place, so it wasn't very uh, scalable or modular and didn't have the required bandwidth. So our, band, our bandwidth uh, provided by this ring for each element con connected to the ring can actually give 96 gigabytes per second at that point if you're talking about running at 3 gigahertz. The multi-bank last level cache for four core product is providing uh, upwards of uh, 380 gigabytes per second. Again, this is 4x what existed in the previous generation, and even the two core product is 190 gigabytes per second, which is also 2x the previous generation. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the addition and removal of cores, caches, and graphics blocks is uh, quite easy in this architecture because it's so regular and it's designed up front to be able to easily support different products. And this uh, ring architecture really uh, started in some form in the server domain uh, just a little earlier than Sandy Bridge, and we've made significant changes to it. And actually, the Sandy Bridge server architecture uh, and interconnect is going to be based on the same ring, and it's going to scale up to a large number of processors. Um, we actually believe this uh, architecture is going to be scalable into any foreseeable future that we have at Intel for the client space. And believe me, we are looking quite far ahead in the future, and we're going to be able to maintain this ring architecture for a long time. Let's talk about the system agent. The system agent really is a block that integrates a lot of the uh, functionality that traditionally used to be in the MCH or GMCH, uh, the IO integration, for example, the memory control or PCI Express ports, um, the connection called DMI, which is the connection to the Southbridge, the IO hub. 
Um, we redesigned, as I mentioned, just like everything else in Standard Bridge, we redesigned all the logic in here to take advantage of the integration, to take advantage of moving to CPU process, to CPU design methodologies, and to get the best power on one hand and performance on the other hand. Um, these are things that contains, as I mentioned, specifically the display engine, even though logically it's part of the graphics uh, device, it sits in the system agent for power reasons. There are many situations, just like this laptop now, all it's really doing is taking the frame buffer from the memory and redisplaying it on the screen all the time. The graphics device itself is not doing anything. The processor graphics are idle. They're probably in a sleep state. So the display engine needs to work almost all the time. The system agent needs to be alive a lot of the time in order to be able to provide this display. Um, that's why we have a separate domain of power and clocking and the display engine sits in that same location so that our battery life would be much better than if the display sat together with the graphics. We also have a power control unit. As a concept that started in the Halem, they introduced a microcontroller that actually sits and it does all the power management algorithms running in firmware on die. So it's really a combination of, of a power control unit microcontroller together with hardware state machines. These things together do all the control. The power management algorithms are very, very complex. It's many thousands of lines of code that can handle uh, all the algorithms we do, and this is all done in firmware in such a way that after silicon arrives, we can both repair things, fix problems, and tune things to the actual silicon results and get the best performance. Um, as I mentioned, this domain of the, north, of the uh, system agent is uh, tightly integrated with the ring domain. The ring domain is the high frequency, high performance, but this other domain is also important for performance. So we provide fast crossovers from the ring frequency and dom into the memory controller, into the PCI Express, giving us uh, um, very low latency. And uh, this domain also handles all the cache coherency needed when I.O. devices are DMA memory around, and that memory may reside in the CPU caches. Uh, you have to do uh, coherency handling, and that's done here as well. As I mentioned, we have separate voltage domains. Uh, we have two variable voltage domains, the graphics in the red, and the cores and last level cache and ring sit on the second domain. These are both variable. They go up and down in frequency and voltage based on controls from the power control unit. While the system agent sits on a third power plane, it is a fixed power plane at low voltage, especially in mobile platforms that will be quite low voltage in order to get the best uh, average power or battery life, as I mentioned. The other two domains are independent in order to allow uh, as was mentioned before, graphics applications to get high graphics performance, high graphics frequency, core dominant applications to get uh, core performance when needed. And the ring and last level cache scale up and down with the cores in order to match the bandwidth needed by the cores. Um, I'll talk a little more about the cache sharing. That's probably one of the biggest innovations in Sandy Bridge is uh, the decision to put the graphics behind the last level cache. Conceptually, the graphics device for us is just like another core. It can decide uh, which of its uh, streams, the graphics driver actually can decide which of the graphics streams, let's say display, uh, yes or no, uh, texture, yes or no, it can decide which of them is going to sit in the last level cache and is going to be coherent. Uh, we have special mechanisms inside the cache to prevent thrashing. If the graphics uses a huge amount of data, we don't want it to totally throw out all the data used by the course, so we can decide how much of the cache is dedicated to graphics and how much is dedicated to the IA cores. Um, we have a concept called multiple coherency domains. I'll go into a little more detail on that in the next session. Uh, that really separates different kinds of data that are shared or not shared between graphics and cores. And again, this saves us power and saves unnecessary snoop transactions uh, going into the cores. And at the bottom line, this last level cache has provided significant performance to the graphics. We have measurements showing how much it gives. We can turn this feature on and off. It gives a lot of performance. It a lot, it, as, as Tom mentioned before, in the mode where you're hitting the cache, you're getting 4x the bandwidth that DRAM can provide, and that's very significant for graphics. We're reducing DRAM bandwidth, which saves power and leaves more headroom for the cores and uh, actual power savings. 
the next thing I'll try to talk about very briefly is power and thermal management. That's again, maybe, maybe even the biggest performance feature in Sandy Bridge is the power management. Um, for our, we really work on two vectors of power, one of them being the performance mode and one being average power of battery life. So on the performance uh, front, we really try to give uncompromising performance while trying to meet all the physical constraints, and I'll list them in a minute. And we have really two improvements over the previous generation. One in the standard uh, <laughs> throughput performance. Our turbo can provide more turbo headroom than previous generations. And in addition, a new concept, a new innovation, the responsiveness, also named uh, Intel Turbo Boost technology, the next generation. Um, I'll talk in more detail and explain that. I actually have three or four slides on that. That innovation allows us to be responsive when a user clicks on some function that he wants to do. Maybe as you saw in the demo previously in the uh, keynote, when he clicks on some heavy duty function, he gets a lot more performance for a long period, up to 20, 25 seconds, and then you go back down to the normal high performance mode. And this is really important for users that actually interact with their programs, click on things, launch an application, you get a much higher boost of performance for quite a while there. And here is the list of things that our algorithms try to take into account when deciding on what voltage and frequency to operate in, both the capabilities of the CPU, the platform specifications, how much the platform can cool, what the power delivery looks like, and the limitations there. We have inputs from the software and the operating system giving requests for performance levels, both for uh, software the driver on the graphics side and the operating system for the cores and there's user controls via user preferences in the operating system on what kind of mode he wants to be in and finally we look at the actual workload running and the usage sometimes there are applications that raising their frequency doesn't give them any performance because maybe they're waiting for disk or memory so we don't ra just unnecessarily raise the frequency there because it just wastes power in that case it's not efficient to increase frequency the second vector, the mobility vector, we strive to go into thinner form factors or in the same smaller thinner form factors to provide a much better user experience and we've been able to do that on Sandy Bridge. Improving battery life, including improving battery life for uh, things like uh, video playback and as well as uh, normal applications. Um, in this domain, it's really too long to go into, but we have enhancements in the core and graphics and package C states. C states are various idle and sleep states that we can go into. We get much better uh, at being in low power and idle modes when we don't need the performance. We have C states algorithms that actually optimize the energy savings, not just the idle power, looking at the user preferences and where you want to be, and again, at the workload. For the, not just for performance mode, but also for average power, we need to see how efficient we are at each frequency and decide what the best operating point is. And we have a lot of uh, algorithms that need to take into account the form factor uh, mechanical, thermal mechanical constraints, how much heat we can dissipate, how quickly. Uh, each platform may be a little different, so there are a lot of knobs in there for the OEM to program in through BIOS to tell us how to tune our algorithms to each platform. I'm going to quickly talk about uh, Intel Turbo Boost technology and try to uh, show the differences. This is a walkthrough. I'm not going to go through all of it, but basically on the left you see the Marone uh, one bin of turbo when the other core was asleep. That's what we were able to provide. Uh, next generation in, in the Clarksfield, Linfield uh, family, we're able to do uh, le one high level of turbo for single core turbo when the other cores are asleep. Then we add a second level for dual core and a third level for quad core. In the Arendelle family, which integrated graphics in the same package, not on the same die, we also introduced dynamic frequency in the graphics domain, but again, we had quite limited uh, capabilities there, and the number of turbo bins when you went to two cores was quite low. Um, I'm supposed to repeat this and say this, the actual bars you see here do not represent actual bins in the final product. So don't go and count the little boxes and say Sandy Bridge is going to come out with this many bins. I will say that Sandy Bridge does achieve a much higher number of turbo bins, especially as you go to four core turbo. We're significantly uh, providing significantly more turbo headroom in the two core and four core product than the previous generation. 
And finally, that little yellow dot is uh, supposed to represent what we call next generation Intel Turbo Boost, which I'll talk about. That's the dynamic uh, part that we can use for 10 or 20 seconds after you've been idle. And again, I'm going to go into more detail on that in the next session. Um, all these together, in, especially in power constrained environments, in mobile uh, platforms, as you go lower and lower in power envelopes, 17 watts, 25 watts, the lower where we go, the boost over the previous generation is actually going to be bigger. We're going to get more performance, more frequency, all of that gets added in together with enhancements on the graphics processor, processor graphics that Tom talked about in the media, in the core features, together with integrated memory controller, with the ring architecture, all these together are going to give a significantly higher performance level in the same power envelopes. And uh, summary. We have uh, everything is new on 32 nanometer, significantly new microarchitecture in the core, large changes in the uh, uh, gra processor graphics. As I mentioned, everything that has to do with integration in the platform is brand new for Sandy Bridge, hasn't been done before in this way. Many of these innovations are first to the industry as well. And we have a very large number of innovations in the power management both for getting performance, getting higher turbo bins, and for doing things more efficiently and saving power in the battery modes and uh, battery life. I want to thank you all. This is the end of this presentation.